Well, thank you all for coming. I just mentioned that um, uh, Jemima and Miriam, the two Congolese singers, were actually singing about a future for humanity in Swahili, their, their tongue. Uh, and you will have heard from their brother that they spent eight difficult years in, a, in an appalling refugee camp in Malawi. And you're right here with such uh, dignity and artistry is um, is an enormous benefit, I think, to um, to all of us. Uh, I'm going to the, the the topic humanity on a bonfire is is a chapter in the book. It's the last chapter, but one I think, and it's without any references because being an academic, you pepper in order to be accused of. Um, not being able to substantiate a point, you tend to, you have to pepper the, uh, your claims with, with evidence. In, when I came to this chapter, I simply gave up in exasperation uh, because I basically tried to look at cruelty as a centerpiece of domestic and foreign policies in just about every dictatorship and every democracy around the world. As some would say, that's quite ambitious when I said to colleague of mine, oh, perhaps I've forgotten Colombia. He said, you can't, you can't do everything. Um, so that's the, the, I've made the first point, and I'm, I'm going to, before I get to the humanity on a bonfire illustrations, and I have four in particular, I'm going to give you a sort of overture to what I'm going to say, because they would be, as it were, guidelines. The first thing to be said is that cruelty is widespread. It is, in my argument, the centerpiece of domestic and foreign policies in just about every state uh, that you could consider. Cruelty is about the wanton imposition of suffering on body and mind. It's prohibited very specifically in, in international law. I think it's clause five of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, clause three of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, you can maybe uh, later ask me um, how I can substantiate the, the claim. The second thing I want to say concerns the context in which has enabled cruelty. It's always been there, of course, um, from time immemorial. But why has it been able to flourish in the past uh, 10 years or so? And it's flourished because of the increasing authoritarianism, the increasing uh, secrecy, the increasing division of democracy and of science, and the, uh, you can see two particular, uh, two particular forms of voting. One was to um, elect uh, Trump to make America great again, and the other was to vote for Brexit to uh, restore the, the grandeur of the British Empire. Both of them both of them with an underpinning of considerable um, uh, racism. That's the third point I want to make by way of introduction uh, concerns how, how it comes to decide who to be cruel to. Who are the, who are the perpetrators and who are the victims? And uh, I, what I discovered, and maybe I should have known it before, uh, two particular things in, in the process. And a wonderful scholar called Michel de Montaigne, a sort of scholar of the Renaissance, looked at the whole business of, of cruelty, why it occurred. Um, the first point to make is that there's hardly any evidence that people are cruel to those whom they consider to be their equal. The, the cruelty is imposed on those considered uh, unworthy. You can almost... Um, you can almost see the process. I mean, they're almost, in many cases, given my time in, on, in, in the Gaza Strip and on the West Bank, um, the Palestinians are largely regarded by the Zionist Israelis as not really human. And it's very interesting with regard to the, the uh, genocide committed against the Rohingya, um, the Rohingya people by the Myanmar military, that they, it, is a, it is illegal even to use the word Rohingya in Burma, in, in, in Myanmar. They, not, they do not exist. And of course we have, we have our own experience of people who don't exist, two particular dates, 1788 and 1948. A land, an empty country that could easily and quickly be populated by the, uh, by the newly arrived beneficiaries. 
and in 1948, the Israeli, the Israeli uh, scientists um, uh, Ben Gurion and Co. Golda Meir said, "This is a land without a people, for a people without a land." So that's the sifting that uh, that uh, that goes on, the to to determine who should be the victims. You can see it all over the place. There are 65 million refugees on the run, moving around. You only have to look at the experiences of the Roma people to know uh, who, uh, to have another example of victims. Now the other consideration that goes with this is that is concerned what I call kind of monumental lying and deceit that facilitates the cruelty. I can't find many examples of state cruelty in which there has not been a massive PR campaign to deny that the cruelty ever occurred. So, the, and you see it at the moment over, over the, um, <laughs> the treatment of uh, Shokat Mossamein, the Labour MP, um, didn't really occur. You can see it over, over the mystery over three years to decide that Dan Oakes, the ABC journalist, um, uh, <coughs> couldn't be charged even though they, uh, <laughs> the police groveled by saying that they knew there was a reasonable, or the, or the government did, there was a reasonable chance that they were going to be successful. So watch the, watch the process of deceit. Uh, I'll come to that a bit more in, 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 uh, in a minute. So those are some of the points by way of, of introduction. The first one being that cruelty is, is there as a centerpiece of domestic and foreign policies. And I, I'm looking at Frank Stilwell here. I should, I, it reminds me to say that cruelty is not a specifically about direct violence. It's also about the consequences of economic and social policies that have determined um, that if, if you look at what goes on in America at the moment, where one in three people do not have enough to eat, where, where, uh, where uh, health care is denied to over, over 20 million people. And that the notion that you should be financially penalised for being sick is a problem around the world without, uh, without uh, universal health insurance. So, um, and it's not just Frank I'm looking to, but people like Joseph Stiglitz and Paul Krugman who've argued the point about what they call cruel America. But I'm not focusing only on on, um, on the United States. Okay, now I'm going to come to the to the um, to the title that looks because of its um, uh, sort of um, uh, dramatic appeal to have brought slightly more people into politics in the past tonight than usual. Humanity on a bonfire. Now a bonf a bonfire originally came from the ancient Druids who wanted to burn. It's really about a burning of bones. That's what the bonfire is. And I'm going to give literal and metaphorical illustrations of why humanity has been chucked on a bonfire. Um, the, 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 first, um, the first illustration comes from the, the, um, the Myanmar military. The driving out of an, as many as a million Rohingya people from their homes and villages to, uh, to be stranded on a muddy hillside somewhere in, I don't know, called Boxes, Coxes Bazaar in Bangladesh. Uh, in one particular instance, uh, witnessed by um, a very significant journalist called Jeffrey Gentleman from the New York Times, um, his, his judgment confirmed by all sorts of onlookers, uh, a young woman called Rajuma had her one-year-old child snatched from her hands, her up from her arms by the by the Myanmar military and thrown into a fire and burnt alive. And they, the, the, that that evidence is repeated many times over. At the same time, some of the women in the particular village that Rajuma came from had been had been raped. Then the village was set on fire. And two days later, the ambassador to Myanmar appeared at a podium in New York at the United Nations to claim that Myanmar was a staunch supporter of civil liberties and human rights. Hence my argument about the massive efforts at denial that go with the facilitation of, of, um, of cruelty. The, the second example 
I'm going to come to. And I'll, I'll explain. I'm going to give four, so you can count them up and think, God, thank goodness he's got to the end now. It's only four. Um, I've been with one. You only want one, Alice? No, I escaped from one. Oh, you, oh, you escaped from one. Okay. I, no, it's two. Yeah, yeah. I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in five minutes' time, Alice. Is that okay? Five minutes' time? Okay. The second example I want to give concerns March 218, the March of Return organized by Palestinians on the Gaza Strip to protest two things, the, the uh, 14th year of the siege of Gaza, which our government and other faithful democratic governments collude with, the, the, um, the siege, the imprisonment of them, of, um, of uh, two million people, one million of whom are children. So they they protested the, the siege, they planned to protest the siege, but they also protested, because it was called the March of Return, the entitlement of, of refugees to go back to their home. And you may remember one of the examples I gave in the film was when when I spent time with the leader of a camp called Burj Al Barajni in the southern suburbs of Beirut, in which he said, um, we, we only want the chance to prove that we are human beings. And there are now five million people locked up in various stages of <coughs> destitution in camps. God knows what's happened during the, the ravaging of, um, of, uh, of uh, COVID-19. So, did, so uh, outside the, the perimeter fence of Gaza on that occasion were Israeli snipers. And by, by um, I think it was July of that year, which coincided with the opening of the American embassy, not a few kilometers away, in Jerusalem. If you remember, they, uh, Trump and, uh, and his son-in-law uh, were, were um, uh, responsible for transferring the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And there was a grand occasion where all these dignitaries were standing around toasting one another. They had some crazy end of time preachers uh, giving, the, giving the opening prayers and the benediction, right, to give it a kind of religious, a religious justification for what they were up to. And a few kilometers down the road, 189 young Gazans were shot dead. And the BBC filmed them, filmed the snipers um, congratulating themselves on getting their, hitting their targets. And um, uh, thousands were maimed, deliberately maimed, many of them for life. By, by, um, by uh, March of this year, the UN confirmed that actually 250 were shot dead and 20,000 20, were, were, were injured, were badly injured. Many of them shot in the leg so they'd be permanently disabled. And yet, in the same breath, this macabre event was going on in... Um, in, in, um, in Jerusalem. Nikki Haley, the American ambassador, said the, said the, made a speech and said the, the Israelis had acted with restraint. And an Australian foreign minister got up and said, it was Judy Bishop at the time, and said it was all the fault of Hamas. No, so using Hamas, and I'm one of the few people who's actually interviewed the leaders of Hamas, um, we can come to that later, but to scapegoat, to deflect attention from who the real culprits are, is really what the dark state is in many ways about. That appalling, and that appalling situation uh, goes on. We're not allowed, we're not allowed openly to be critical of Israel because of, because of the, the absurd charge of, of, of anti-Semitism. Of anti it's one of the issues I deal with at some length in the, in the book. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm against any undue prejudice, whether it's homophobia or Islamophobia or anti-Semitism. But to be critical of a government that, that, um, that is basically, and has been for so long, uh, uh, admired in the culture of, of, uh, of war and uh, militarism, and flogs its products, particularly its surveillance products, all around the world. It has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. 
Let me, is that two examples I've given Alice? Are you paying attention, Alice? <laughs> uh, okay, the third, third example I want to give concerns a town uh, out, uh, outside Jakarta called Surabaya, in which, um, in a church, in an Anglican church, um, a family uh, converted their three small children into suicide bombs and took them into the church and blew the kids up and killed uh, 57 people and injured, um, uh, uh, sorry, killed 29 people and injured uh, up to 60 others. Simultaneously with that, of course, um, a, a young Australian went to Christchurch and murdered uh, 51 uh, Muslims in a mosque in, in Christchurch. The, the depravity, the cruelty that's involved in, in that in those measures raises a question which is central to me whether this is some sort of psychological aberration or whether there's a cultural background that makes it possible that gives that gives the that gives the potential sadists all the cues to act as they do. Um, so that's the that's the, the third example and um, uh, that dreadful beheading in the streets of Paris uh, yesterday or the day before is, is just another example piled upon, uh, uh, piled upon pile, which reflects the, the fascination with violence and what I call the complete illiteracy about non-violence. You can see it, you can, the, I've, I've, I had a look at the, the thuggery that passes for government in Russia, and in particular in Russian prisons. Where, where violence to prisoners, and, problem, and that's true of them, America, which boasts almost the biggest, the biggest uh, prison population in the world. The notion that, that violence is a way to, to solve almost any problem, because it's, it's, it's an intellectually lazy way of, of running, a uh, subject, running, running a state. Okay, the last example I'm going to give concerns the Sekhna, Sekhna Yaya prison just outside Damascus, one, one and a half kilometers from uh, Bashar al-Assad's palace. There were about uh, 10,000 men, mostly men, uh, locked up in that prison during the course of the Civil War. And when eventually, about a year ago, the family has turned up to there was to be a declaration of what had happened to them so that the paperwork could be delivered. Because the odd thing about murderers is, they, is that they, they, keep, they keep records of what they do. So the UN came across these photographic records of what had happened in that prison. So on this occasion, there could be little uh, denial. They, were, they only admitted to the, the disappearance <coughs> Of or the, the death rather of 400 out of that number, and the claims were almost entirely that they that the um, the people who lost their lives died of heart attacks and strokes. So again, again, the the, the, the massive concern with with, with 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 deceit to as it were foster foster the cruelty. Now comes the question: Well, can you really? Can you really distinguish between between the the Myanmar military throwing small children into a bonfire, uh, the Israeli <coughs> snipers, uh, the the Surabaya um, uh, families blowing their kids up, and the torture with, that is a part of government by Bashar al-Assad's Syria? Uh, people say to me, it's all too complex. But when I hear that argument about complexity with regard to policy, with regard to policy analysis, I usually discover that it is a way to deflect from the truth of what actually went on. And my argument is that there's no difference between the, this, the Israeli snipers and the, and the Surabaya bombers and, uh, and the, um, the Syrian torturers and the behavior of the Myanmar military. It's a common theme, and we need to name it as such, because when I looked at uh, 20 years of famous policy textbook, textbooks on public policy, the word cruelty doesn't appear in any index. So how strange, 
how strange that what is, I mean, I have, there's overwhelming evidence in the book, and it's not all macabre, by the way. I'll come to the light-hearted bit in a minute. You want some light-hearted bit, Alice? Um, how strange, yeah, even the fact that, even the fact, I mean, Australia's claims about mateship are really a form of disguise. Go and ask the indigenous people, ask the asylum seekers on, on, on Malice, um, uh, ask any of the 12,000 people who are wandering around this city at the moment on bridging visas, with no prospect of anything. But as long as Scott Morrison goes to church on Sunday, we can claim that we are a Christian nation. <laughs> Let me, I'll make, I'll, uh, I'll make, uh, one, I mean, one form of cruelty is for, is when academics go on for too long. Interesting that religion is involved. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, religion is involved. Look, religion, religion, sexuality, and militarism I com combine the, the flo I looked at, I looked at the flogging that went on in, 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 um, in parts of Indonesia and Saudi Arabia. I mean, if you want to be entertained after Friday prayers in Saudi Arabia, you could, after, after being highly reverent, and go out and watch flogging, amputations, and executions. And yet they're, they're some of our best allies. I mean, there's a dance to death between the United States and, and, Sa and the Saudis. You only have to look at the, at the, what the, the events of, the, of the, Yemeni, the Yemen war, the dissemination, almost the dissemination of a whole people. Uh, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, the, the really, I, I find it difficult, and it's not just a Freudian analysis, to, to I find it difficult not to say that uh, there's a certain sexual pleasure derived from the massive cruelties that are imposed by religious authorities. Now, I'm not going to drift into the inquiry into the sexual abuse of children here, but you can, you can see the link. Okay, let me come, I'll spend two minutes on the optimistic bit, because the second part of the, um, of the book, and I'll, ho I'll hold up the, the cover. The cover shows the God of Tor smashing the hell out of just about anybody, crushing every human being. And the, the, other, the, the figure with the wings is, is Phoenix rising from the ashes. That's really about those, what those two beautiful young women were singing about, but in Swahili. What is, what is a socially just post-COVID society going to look like? Before I get to the optimistic bit, it does occur to me that I've been talking about human beings to human beings. But the quick scan of, of newspapers and listening to the news in the past 48 hours shows you that almost all of the planet is, is on fire. There are massive fires in, in, um, uh, in Bolivia, in Argentina, in, in, in Patagonia. Um, there are massive fires. I used, to live in, I used to live in Colorado. They, they have the biggest fire ever in the history of that state. There have been fires across California, Oregon, Washington State, fires across Siberia. So if you take the indigenous people's point of view, that you cannot separate the health of the people from the from the health of the land, one thing I learned on the Reconciliation Commission, that you can't really make the distinction in terms of people's identity. You'd have to say that humanity on a bonfire is the, is, is the planet chucked into the fire as well. The, the, and and we, have to, we, have to think, we have to think differently. And to think differently is really what I call a language for humanity. If we're going to talk about a more optimistic future, we have to have a language, we have to have the words, the vocabulary to, to do it. There's been such a fascination with violence as the way to solve problems. You remember that uh, Christopher Pine's last throw of the dice before he left was to say that he wanted Australia to move from 20th in the league table of people, of countries that sold arms, to 10th. Great, and, and, and Morrison was recently, two days ago, was featured driving a bloody tank down some street, as though as though that form of chess beating was the was the was the way to think, and you can see it, of course, in the in the epidemic of of domestic violence. So there has to be another language, 
it's what I call the language of humanity. It's redefining politics to mean that you only use power in a creative, um, life-enhancing way. It's about redefining uh, human rights to say that it's not, it's not only the preserve of lawyers, and all my struggles with human rights in dangerous places are about the context in the home, on the streets, in the workplace, and usually, usually on a Friday night when it was raining and nobody else was around. So, so that's got to be redefined. And the last point, I suppose, is about um, humane governance, what the wonderful Richard Ford called humane governance, which in, in many ways is not about peace but about peace with justice, ensuring that issues about poverty and, and homelessness um, and um, an education and universal health insurance are centerpiece of, of, a, of a future society. The last point I will make, and I keep on saying, I must have said last point about 20 times, I'm sorry. Um, I pepper the book with illustrations from music and poetry, but in particular poetry, because uh, Percy by Shelley, the wonderful um, uh, English poet who, who protested about violence and who was a great advocate of non-violence, said that poets were the unacknowledged legislators of the world, yeah. which is a wonderful vision. In other words, you, we, need to paint, we need to paint that picture. And, you know, Beethoven wrote his Ninth Symphony, the Peace Symphony, which, which he said he wanted to be a triumph for humanity inside and outside the concert hall, right? But, and, and it became, the last movement, became the national anthem of the European Union. So powerful that the British people were, were encouraged to vote against it. <laughs> so, um, lots of illustrations to give. Udru uh, Nudakol, last illustration, the wonderful, um, Indigenous poem from Australia, a uh, poem she wrote 70 years ago. And you think about the racism that's going on in America and around the world. It was called All One Race. I'm for, um, I'm for humanity, not colour jives. I'm international, never mind tribes. I'm international, never mind place. I'm for humanity, all one race. Okay, that's, thank you. Very much. Very much. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, please give uh, Stuart another round of applause for that presentation. <laughs> to introduce Linda Lovechild for a short song, uh, which is Protest is Good.
<laughs> if you go out, if you go out on the streets today, then take all your friends with you. The right to protest is yours and mine. Watch out for the thin blue line. As long as you're wearing your 40 shorts, you can get away with all sorts of broads. Today's the day to get out and get loud for justice. Whether it's for the, whether it's for the environment, or refugees, or Julian Assange, or just free speech, point your placards to the sky. Let's all, let's all practice what we preach. Let's stand up for human rights. You know you've got to try to take it on the chin. Put his scarf around your neck, sacred as a crucifix. If you go down to a demo today, then take all your friends with you. Just say that you're exercising your rights when coloured by boys in blue. And if the cop takes off his badge, you get to beat him very bad. You better run or you wind up dead. No justice. Thank you. My name is Glenn Burtons, and I'm a new, new, new coming here. Hello? My question is, you mentioned, you asked the question, um, the, the violence we see perpetrated by individuals, is that a psychological dysfunctional individual committing the crime, or is it uh, people getting a dog whistle message from the powers that be that allow them to go ahead and do what they think sure. authorities want them to do? Sure. So we'd like you to speak to that please. Speak more to that. Look, I, 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 I've avoided making any claim about the psychology of the perpetrators. Um, three, three responses to your in good question. The first is what um, Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil, and what, what I call the evil of banality, namely that the whole culture gave, gives the cue to the adult vitamins of the world. Right? It, it was regarded as a, a relatively unexceptional human being who committed, committed mass murder. So and the idea that it would only have occurred in Germany is of course a nonsense. And there were, and there were massive bureaucracies that facilitated that process. The second part of my response to your question is concerns what I call the automaton behaviour encouraged by bureaucracies. We only have to go down the road to Canberra to look at, to examine the decision making in the Department of Home Affairs. It's mostly invisible, it's mostly inaccessible. Uh, the bureaucrats, and I'm one of the few people who's invaded the place, are, are living, uh, operating in fear. So the automaton behaviour in bureaucracy is another uh, issue. And there is, a, there is a fascination with sadism as the third response, which is encouraged, encouraged by, um, by states and by non-state actors. You only have to think of the, uh, I mean, I'm talking mostly about states, but, but the states encourage the appalling response to, to cruelties in, in, in forms of sadism. Why else would um, young students in, in the Aceh province of Indonesia arrive early to climb up trees to watch women being flogged for standing too close to their boyfriend? Right? Um, but the sadism that go, if you look at the, the number of, 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 of Afro-American prisoners who've lost their lives in American prisons, um, you'd have to say that there's a sort of culture of sadism that's part of governance. So I've avoided the, 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 the psychological trap. Okay, Frank, I want to get your opinion on Jacinta Ahern. Uh, because you talked about state violence, yet here we have, of course, the ditch there, a political leader who, when asked what's the most important feature of political leadership, said kindness. Sure. Now, and she just got elected uh, with a clear majority government in New Zealand uh, in living memory. Uh, that, sure. 
is this a signal, not just that there are alternatives, but that governments that act kindly offer an alternative to state right. violence? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, she's an amazing community, amazing communicator, as well as somebody who expresses great warmth and, and, and love. Why wouldn't the word love be be a, a, a central feature of the crafting of policies, right? I mean, the, the buying of more missiles or building more submarines is, so why wouldn't, why wouldn't the love that she expresses um, uh, be a feature of policy? I'm reminded of W.H. Orton's poem, September the 1st, 1939, at the outbreak of the Second World War, when he said, the, the, um, we must love one another or die. Right? Now, um, that, uh, that, that, that's, that's absolutely uh, crucial. When I used to be responsible for investigating departments at the University of Sydney where, where, the, where there was a lot of staff conflict, where people didn't get on with one another, um, they used to appoint, ask professors who knew nothing about anything and were therefore regarded as neutral to have a look at these sort of things. And usually I found it was men throwing their weight around. The expression of love and kindness and humour and satire was, was completely absent. Um, and you see, it, you see it in domestic violence. I mean, I used to say to guys in domestic violence, I mean, is there another way, is there another way to live your life? What do you mean then, mate? So what... <laughs> What other language can you use? And of course, the, I mean, here I'm going to drift into some kind of psychology. I mean, people have been brought up with undue experience of violence, have learned how to repeat it. But, yeah, sure. I mean, and the love has to be for planet Earth. There's no, we're, 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 we're destroying it. We've almost destroyed it. Um, so, uh, and, and the greed and cons the concern with consumption you know, we've got, we've just had a budget that says we need to have more money to go and buy more shirts and more trousers that we don't need because the retail index is going to be an indicator of the recovery of Australia. Uh, but now come back to, come back to, um, you know, great music, uh, great um, uh, hospitality. They're all expressions of the kindness and warmth that, um, that uh, Jacinda showed. And look at the massive cruelty towards Julian Assange and the failure of, uh, of most Australian politicians and most, almost all mainstream Australian journalists to ever say anything on his behalf. Because cowardice is such an easy option. Because the other time, you know, there's a certain amount of courage about, about uh, Jacinda Ardern and breaking the mould. Um, Anyway, let's. Uh... Okay, let's go to the lady over here. And where's the. Can I? And then the next hand. And then Mark up. Uh, yeah, it seems that cruelty is. It seems that cruelty is very tied in with power uh, and always has been. You do it my way, or our way, or the majority's way, or this regime's way, or we will punish you, and God hates people who doesn't obey his laws, and by the way, that imaginary friend was created in our image, and our rather badder type of parts of our character, the darker parts of us, I think. And... Um, so there's always a justification, or, or you know, even if something happens on the planet that might be just a scientific fact, like a volcano, oh, God's punishing all the dope smokers in California. Um, anyway, it does seem to be power to punish people, destroy them, whatever, and often with religious justification. Look, it's a great question. I'll just say that, that one of the themes that runs through the book is about almost every other page questioning 
the way power is exercised. Essentially, power for centuries has been operated disproportionately by men in a top-down way. They may, be, they may be politicians, they may be military generals, they may be religious leaders, they, and they only seek conformity. You could see that in a moment with the, the moment with the behaviour of police instructed by their by their masters somewhere in Canada. So the exercise of power, you are absolutely correct, is crucial to understanding cruelty. The what I call the multi-dimensional exercise of power, which is a thousand times more interesting than this this do as I do as I say, um, is. <coughs> I've said to politicians, why don't you try it? It's good for your health, mentally and physically. And the, that, the creative, creativity, even of this lady's song, that's an expression of uh, multi-dimensional power, if you like. It, it, was, it was entertaining, it sent a message, it hurt nobody. But yeah, power of crucial issue. Just talk, mate. Uh, they uh, really uh, inspired by a lot of that discussion because it really gets to stuff that's bedeviled my brain for, well, forever really, and that is what drives the you know, Nazi oppression, what drives the way in which Pol Pot operated, why the masses of people are oppressed in, in, in otherwise peaceful Buddhist states. And uh, I just think that the questions of psychology and culture and the notion of what is evil is all part of the thing. But it seems to me, and I wonder about your impressions of that, the power of the ruling class to decide their interests and drag people in. I mean, there's a stack of Israeli people who violently, aggressively oppose what their state is doing. Uh, and of course, anybody under a Nazi regime, uh, the same way, but you're just oppressed by the needs of that ruling class to promote its interests. Is that something we need to expand on a bit in your analysis? Yeah, absolutely. But the ruling class are sometimes the military. I mean, I looked at the dictatorships in Argentina, Brazil, um, Chile, right? So one set of ruling class of the military. And incidentally, when, and, but there's a collusion. See, policy, policy by cruelty do, involves collusion between states. In, in, the, in the evidence about torture and cruelty in Brazil under military dictatorships, when they cross-examined some of the torturers, they said, where did you get the idea from? They said, we were flown to England because that's where, the, that's where you learn best. Um, when I looked at some of the, um, uh, car, the, the genocide in, under African dictatorships, you could see the French and the Americans and the British turning a blind eye to it because they... they <laughs> so, yeah, the ruling class are different groups and really you only have to look at the theocracies in Saudi Arabia, Indonesia and so on um, to see that the ruling class are fascinated with control because understanding that power could be liberating to everybody and, and the question I use to when I'm meeting with men who've been massive bullies, I usually say to them, would you like to make your life more interesting? Not, it's a kind of neutral question. It's not, you know, on your deathbed, will you regret that you, you didn't beat up more people, but you might regret that your life wasn't very interesting. So, I mean, in other words, the language has got to be different. The language in universities and schools, in politics, in the pub, in parliaments, the language has to be different. You know, I mean, I was brought up in, in a classical music tradition. Unlike Frank, I'm not very good at pop. Um, but, but you have to learn, you have to learn a language to, to consider. When, when, you know, I spent some of my student years in the Soviet Union under Paul Garnin and Khrushchev. Um, I won't say what I did. Um, my mother thought I was going to desert. Um, but the authoritarianism was, it was as though Nobody could think of a, of a different way of behaving. I mean, one of the problems in America 
is they think they're so exceptional that they can't think of another way of living. <laughs> so I'm not sure I've answered your question, but it's a, but it's it's crucial. Yeah, thank you. I think it's to Jim. Jim. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Stuart. Um, I'm not sure how it's possible to get a copy of your book, but uh, have you got them here tonight? No, I've only got that one. No, no. They're in, there's plenty in the books. Okay, all right. Well, we all want to get a copy, obviously, after tonight. Um, I mean, my, my question is about the fact that so-called civilization has marched, if you, and using your concept of cruelty, you know, on the one hand, there's the advance of cruelty, and on the other hand, there's the advance of kindness, if you want to call it, yeah. like human rights. And what's happened over centuries and thousands of years is that those two, those two tendencies in the human, that's the same word, um, in, the, in, in human uh, society have, have conflicted. And I just wanted you to comment on the fact that in one sense, you could, there's two ways that it's happened. On the one hand, cruelty has advanced on an industrial scale. Sure, sure. So you get, you know, the Auschwitz uh, ovens on an industrial scale. You get the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima, sure. the elimination of 100,000 people in 0.5 of a second. Sure, sure. And then you get all the cruelty advances in that way. But on the other side of things, you've got the advance of kindness and humanity, which starts from things like even the Magna Carta way back, or, you know, the yeah, Enlightenment, sure. and then through all this to today, where we're talking about an alternative system, which would be socialism. So I wonder, I don't know whether this, I presume you do deal with this in some way in the book, but maybe you could comment on it. Well, look, we got it. Let's go only back as far as 1948. Never again the crafting of the United Nations, the Geneva Convention, um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That was the, if you like, the kindness motive in, in, in your terms. Um, and, but it has to be grafted onto a, a um, uh, political system or into economic and social policies that match the aspirations that were in the small print of those documents. And in a way, I'm the beneficiary because after, in post-war Britain, there was one of the great architects of what happened was, was a professor at the LSE who never had an undergraduate degree. Who it's said, yeah, 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 well, it was beverage to start with and then it, and then it was Richard Titmus. He said, it, Policy should be about the dominance of altruism over egoism. Yeah? Not make, not restore the British Empire, not, not accumulate, accumulate, not make America great again. So for a time, there was the, and certainly that's the culture I was brought up in. And uh, education has a great deal to do. We have to be, we have to talk about education. There's, I, mean, I talk a lot about nuclear cruelty. If you listen to the if you listen to the uh, survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's almost more than you can do to read um, what, what they say. But equally, the, the poetry of some of the forgotten generation, the, the, sorry, the stolen generation of indigenous people, of indigenous young people, I mean, the cruelty that went on in the name of the Australian state that was quickly followed by the, the, the uh, abuse of thousands of young people sent from Britain to have a better life in Australia. And that was quickly followed by the by taking away the children of so-called unmarried mothers in, in, their, in their thousands. So that it was almost as though intellectually there, there was no other language. There was no, and eventually you only have to read the apologies of Rudd and Gordon Brown and Julia Gillard about those atrocities to see that if you don't speak the language, there's no way of having a discussion. And in a way, that brilliant um, English comedian who committed suicide here in the 50s or 60s, Tony Hancock, was about, in a way, some of his humor was about the absence of conversation in families. I mean, it, was, it was incredibly funny. 
Because the conversation in some families was limited to, did you put the cat out? Have you put the milk bottles out? And when, when I worked in the courts, and I spent the first three years of my professional career in, in, the, in the Central Criminal Court in London, the Old Bailey, um, what I discovered was that uh, until people got into trouble with the law, nobody had ever taken them very seriously. They, they hardly, many of them had hardly ever had a, a substantial conversation with anybody until they, till the law caught up with them or they caught up with the law. So if you want to talk about the, the kindness side of the dimension of your, of your argument, Jim, um, it has to be all of, us, all of us making an effort to learn a new language, even if it's not always to the tune of um, the teddy bear's picnic. Teddy Bear's Picnic. Um, if you'd like to uh, be entertained by more of uh, Lynn's uh, wonderful, um, uh, aka Professor Linda Lovechild's um, wonderful spiritual works, uh, Poets of Peter Shambolo, we're returning there on the third Thursday of November. It's an open mic uh, poetry and music night. Uh, so, my question uh, concerns the uh, role of um, social media today, particularly the increasing divisiveness. Uh, that it virtually creates uh, social bubbles according to which political uh, meaning you have. Uh, compared to, say, in the past, where there might have been more face-to-face -face interactions and uh, discussion of even uh, opposite uh, beliefs and so on, it seems that um, in that sort of context that's um, uh, not as easy to happen. And um, I was thinking even now with... Um, because of uh, COVID and more and more people working at home from Zoom, even that um, opportunity which people had in the past at uh, workplaces, great diversity, including political diversity, being able to discuss and argue these other years, a lot of that um, seems to be being lost with um, these uh, bubbles and sort of the way that algorithms are worked out that uh, you're only served, you know, articles and so on according to what they figure out to be your alignments and that sort of thing. So your thoughts on the um, impact, um, it is a kind of violence in a sense, um, and how that could uh, translate from the violence of language on the um, in social media through to uh, potentially more violence and on the streets and so on and political uh, spheres like that. Yeah, look, the, um, f first of all, a, a, a response that isn't entirely about your question, I'll come to the social media, and that's about the, the notion going around that technology is going to save us all, that a, a better technology will deal with this. We need to be, you know, be, you need to have cheaper degrees for people who are going to do IT, right? And people, who, and people are going to be taught to think should pay twice as much. So beware that, beware that process. On the social media question, yeah, it, it can be in, incredibly dangerous. I mean, the evidence is that, that uh, young people are able to buy a newspaper. The notion that reading a book from beginning to end at university, well, goodness me, that's, a, that's become a heresy. I mean, I was so slow at university, I had to read books several times before I got the gist of the argument. Now that would be regarded as not cost effective. Um, and, and so the only instructions you get is CWWW dot. So the, 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 the other thing about social media that's very dangerous, I mean, the, in some of, the, some of the abuse that I received for protesting uh, along Stephen Langford lines about the treatment of, of asylum seekers and refugees, I mean, the abuse, I could have filled the whole, the whole book with the abuse that I got on social media. And I'm, I'm nowhere near as active as, as Stephen is. So he could publish an encyclopedia, I should think. So, and it's very, the other, the other dimension that's occurring around the world are these conspiracy theories. So the notion that, I mean, I'm no, I'm no moralist. I'm not, a, I'm not necessarily a very moral person. But the idea that you should um, not try to discover truths, I, can't, I couldn't get a publisher for a book like that if I hadn't covered myself in every possible way to substantiate the claims I'm making about the behaviour of, 
of, of, of powerful people. But now, you know, there are conspiracy theories about this QAnon, which Trump says is, is plausible. Apparently a group of pedophiles, something to do with um, a pizza shop close by to where Hillary Clinton lived, um, are, are threatening, threatening our existence. There's a derision of science. You can see that in the behavior of the National Party here. So the, the, when you think that, the, that even, even the, the anti-vaccination campaign, I was in, um, in Mullumbimby, beautiful Mullumbimby not very long ago, it's completely consumed, not completely, that's an exaggeration, I withdraw completely. It, it's, it is somewhat preoccupied, is that better? Somewhat preoccupied. Frank has nodded so I feel, feel easier. With conspiracy theories about about HG about about um, uh, 5G sorry 5G about anti-vaccination um, about uh, QAnon they're they're all and the more they they're speaking a language and they meet together and they practice the language and once they practice it they can they can pass it on so yeah beware of the social media in that respect I mean. Um, in every respect. Uh, in every respect. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm talking too much. Okay. I differ with you, Stuart. I think the media are quite evil and leak as well. So be careful if you're using Facebook and you're tweeting because it's even less secure than, than emails, which are not secure. I've got a bigger fear, actually. I think that with everybody having their mobiles with all the information, families go to dinner, nobody speaks. They're all on their little box. And I fear we're going to lose the power of speech. <laughs> not you and I, Alice, it's okay. <laughs> no, I will not lose it. <laughs> but I'm also not with the person that said there are stacks of people in Israel who oppose the regime. I would know a bit more about Israel because I've got relatives there. And I have relatives that died there. And the early Zionists were a different breed, actually, even Ben Gurion was, to this lot. Because they still knew Palestinians as human beings. They worked with them, they employed them. But now, my relatives there don't know any Palestinians. I can't tell you how badly they behave because they have no idea. I lived in an Arab hotel in Jerusalem and I wondered whether they would even come and see me. They did come, but I was mortified at how they behaved. Uh, but I'm more disturbed, actually, in what I see as the apathy of the public everywhere. The public do not know and they do not care. They wouldn't know who Julian Assange was. They wouldn't know about it. And they wouldn't care about it. And that's scary. And that was the case about the Germans as well. My relatives were hidden for a while. But I can't tell you how difficult it was for someone to find them somewhere to hold up for a night. Not their friends. 
they didn't want to know. So I think the apathy of the world is a very big danger. Yeah, yeah. Bravo. That's Alice. Thank you. Thank you very for that contribution. I mean, I, I'm, I'm only going to respond briefly because you you've said it better than I do. Um, two things. You use the word fear. There's a great effort around in, in, in the organs of government to create fear. I only have to think, listen to this, to Warner, the chief of um, um, Asia tonight, talking, you know, we should be, there is foreign interference, it's all over the place. Every politician should know. It's all about creating fear, fear of, of, the, of the other. The second point you make, which is enormously valuable, is the, is the manifest ignorance of the public. Um, a quick example, I, I, um, <coughs> I've been scribbling in a coffee shop on the south coast and a friend who worked in a bookshop rushed in and thanked me for the book. And when I walked outside, <coughs> she was having coffee with a friend uh, at a table on the pavement. She introduced me to the friend and the woman said, what's your book about? I said, well, it's about trying to get people to think differently about the future. And she said, it would be a good idea to get people to learn to think. You know, you could, which relates to your, to your point. I think that's enough from me. Okay, so I think it's Jefferson. Jeff. Uh, thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, not only for writing your own book, but for doing the introduction to Buxy Blasna book called East Timor Rebelle for Courage, which was about the three years she spent on the ground there between 98 and 2001 during the UN referendum, which she, she was amazed at the courage of the Timorese people. Now, uh, this mic keeps cutting in and out. Um, I'll just speak without it, is that yeah. all right? Uh, you, you want to get your mics tested before next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if they, they, without the interjections, uh, I, I think you're wise to cut short your comment on Mullumbimby first because you plagiarised it off the 7.30 report. And, <laughs> and se secondly, because the Country Witches Association uh, would have your balls for breakfast because uh, you didn't include them in the list of conspiracy theorists. Which one? Which one? The Country the Witches right. Association. Oh. Anyway, uh, they did a recent show with Peter Shabolo, if you Google it. Uh, yours truly got mentioned in Facebook postings thereafter. Um, what I wanted to say was three aspects of your thing. The, the word the title of your book, which is Cruelty and Humanity, or Humanity, or humanity the word Cruelty, where does that fit in terms of Peter McGregor's campaign at John Clancy's auditorium 20 years ago when he was arrived, where he put out a flyer attacking 2,000 trendy arts people in Sydney for celebrating 100 years of torture uh, on the anniversary of a bloke called Artur, is it A-R-T-A-U-D? Uh, and they had a conference on 100 years of torture. I raise that in the context of both postmodernism and the contemporary art world where Maria Abranovich is brought out to Sydney as one of these gurus and you'll have people like Mike Parr who constantly hangs himself upside down by fish hooks wherever he exhibits his body art and inflicting pain is perceived by the art world as a, 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 a positive thing rather than an aspect of cruelty. Now that's the sociological postmodernist art world I'd like you to address in terms of their perceptions and I'm not going to go on about Hollywood and all that. The second thing I wanted to bring to your attention was the uh, famous American uh, writer and academic uh, Dr. Alfred McCoy, who used to teach at General Studies in New South Wales University when I was there with Professor Gunn, who has traced out 
the CIA and American intelligence use of torture. So I would like you to distinguish the generalist word cruelty from the word torture as a policy of governments where they fit in because I think your generalist word cruelty has enabled you to slide under that specific state issue to one of a generalist one where you bring in your humanity aspect as a response to cruelty in general, individual versus state. And my final question on this aspect of cruelty is for you to expand on your use of the word cruelty as opposed to state policies like torture and like inflicting pain. Well, that's, that's what I'm getting at. The generalist word cruelty versus the art world's celebration of things like pain and the, the CIA intelligence state celebration of things like torture as a weapon of, con of yeah. pursuing foreign policy objectives. Look, uh, I mean, torture, so, <coughs> torture and uh, all sorts of circumstances, uh, sorry, torture and all sorts of circumstances is central to cruelty. I just chaired a, a worldwide webinar on, on torture with people in Geneva, um, Hawaii, London and so on, um, because it's it has grown under the camouflage of COVID-19. So that the, the um, it's not something you can measure in the, by the Department of Statistics, but it's, it's quite evident that the, the violence and the fascination with cruelty, which includes torture, has increased under the, under the people's preoccupation with COVID-19. It's allowed, you know, I was recently in the Philippines where Duterte's Cruelty is to the power of a of hundred, but an easily increased uh, under COVID-19 where we were told that if we trespass outside at the wrong time, we were, uh, the police were entitled to shoot us. The question of art as, yeah, look, uh, that, that takes me to the, what I call the thin end of the wedge argument. If you tolerate the slightest form of cruelty, you give a license to drop atomic bombs and the palm and flog people. Um, I view it against some people's judgment. I refer to Alan Jones as saying that um, Julian Gillard's father died of shame. Because for me, that was an example of, of cruelty. Because it's the thin end of the wedge argument. Once you allow something like that to go un, un, unopposed, um, then that's, um, uh, that's, that's gives a kind of blank check for um, potentially sadistic people to do what they like. What was the, so what's the third? Well, what about the lefties defending piss Christ in terms of freedom of speech, even though it offended every single religious person in Australia, you know, when it came out here and exhibited the National Gallery or State Gallery. The whole art world is based on cruelty and pain. Yeah. Not based on it, but they celebrate no. Through the historic well, that's bollocks, Jeff. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I've taken the easy way out by agreeing with everybody tonight until now, Jefferson. <laughs> I'm trying <laughs> to be <laughs> provocative. <laughs> um, so, no, no, I don't know. Look, you saw those as a form of art, as an art form, you saw Miriam and Jemima, those two Congolese singers at the beginning. And um, nothing cruel about that. Okay. Can, I, can I say something from behind yeah. the... Yeah. Okay, there's two things missing this evening. I'm sorry, this is very, very interesting and very good. Two things missing. One is Sarah Cooper and the other is Monty Python's Flying Circus. Yeah. yeah. And I sort of stumbled... What was the first one? Sarah Cooper. Yeah. Who takes a piss out of... Out of... Um, uh, out of, out of uh, uh, I, I call him... Um, I don't call him what his name is. Caligula. Yeah, sure. and, uh, and, and Monty Python, who took the piss out of just about everything. And that's what was missing. We just don't... Not I taking the piss enough. I, I, not, Stephen, not taking the piss enough seems to be a wonderful note to end on. Because <laughs> if, there's no, if there's no satire, yeah. you can't understand. Yeah. Because satire is a, is, is a multi-dimensional expression of power, which gets at the, the consensus view of the world. And um, look, you only have to think of uh, Monty Python's um, The Meaning of Life. What happened to, to, if you want to understand what we're doing to the planet, 
Just think of the behavior of Mr. Creosote in Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. He was the enormously fat bloke who kept on consuming and consuming and consuming and threw up and then consumed more and eventually it blew up. You remember? And um, uh, uh, that's what we've been doing to the, that's what we're doing to ourselves and to the planet. Um, the last point about satire, you know, to reassure you, Stephen, when I was living in the States, I used to say to, to Americans, if you had more satire, you wouldn't have capital punishment. Well, they didn't have a clue what that meant. <laughs> okay, I think that's enough for me. Okay. Another question? Oh, sorry. Sorry, John. <coughs> Thanks for the talk, Stuart. Much appreciated. Uh, I just want to center up the issue of cruelty, particularly as it lies within, stay right there, just stay right there, there. particularly as it lies within production and as we have in the moment, capitalist production. There, there are, I was saying a couple of weeks ago, there are... Let's get rid of the microphone. Yeah, no, get rid no, of the no, you're doing well, you're doing well, you're doing well. When, when you talk to... When people teach economics, they tell you the three factors of production, the basic factors, land, land, and capital. Speak up. Speak up to speak up. Speak up. Um, Horizontal. But just speak up. Horizontal. That's it. You got it. Um, the most significant part of that is how people fit into that. And people are purely and essentially factors, factors or production. There's a chapter in a book by E.A. Bowman on Australian economic development of migration. We would think of bidding farewell to people that are coming to Australia getting those jo other jobs. In his book, it's called Factor Migration. The people leaving are factors. Mm -hmm. And in production, you can do as it used to be um, before, at least up to the 19th century, you can do what you want with people. You know, slaves were used in Greece, slaves were used sure. in Rome. Sure. In the 1700s and 1800s, people worked and, and the only difference in the 19th century was they got some pay for it as opposed to no pay for it. Now the response to that was socialism. And in the second half of the 20th century, in some of the Anglo countries, if not in continental Europe, we had some major parties, like the Labour Party in England and the ALP here, who said, well, you know, we should have an approach to government where people, are, where we take care of the people around us. Socialism is about looking out for everything. Sure. Now, if you come into the 21st century, both the, the party here has given up on that. Sure. And so has the party in England. I, I, I read a statement that Paul Keating gave at New, New South Wales Uni 1998. And he said, well, we came into power, meaning Hawke in 1983. We believe that market forces were the best way to improve people's lives. Well, market forces were what, was what existed in the 19th century before the Labour Party ever came to be. Hawke and Keating simply returned it to ground zero. But what I'm thinking is now, in, in the year 2020, the only party I can see here that are going to take up some policy of looking out for people and not having people treated like cattle are, are number one the Greens. Um, the housing commission policies are actually the whole, which used to be Chifley's policies and now the policies of the Greens. And, and secondly, you know, we should have some form of media and information where we can get these ideas out there. In America, you've got democracy now, which I listen into, but we just don't have that here. So in terms of preparing for how we can maybe respond to the cruelty that's re-emerging around us, do you think focusing maybe on the Greens or focusing well, on alternative ways, establish our knowledge? Sure. First of all, I want to... Go? Look, it's a great analysis, John, characteristically. Um, I've, I've dealt, look, the large part of the book is to say that humane governance means dealing with all the appalling effects of capitalism. That, that and we should be able to say that. And we should be able to say that socialism is essentially about fellowship as far as I'm, I was concerned. So we have to be unashamed about um, dealing with the problems of capitalism. The, the poverty, the suicide rates of young, of young people, of people feeling no prospect of employment, no prospect of housing, um, racism uh, uh, rampant, the fascination with the, uh, nuclear, nuclear weapons, the, the appalling treatment of asylum seekers and refugees, 
So, uh, yeah, and it's in, it's, in, it's in the notion of production. I mean, it's essential, before I get to the greens, I want us all to adopt a different way of thinking, a different way of speaking, a different language. You have to have the language. Because if, if we say, oh, it's going to be the Greens, I don't disagree with your interpretation of that. You immediately get, what is it for about the Greens? And you get the city members of the, like, of the state Labour Party saying, you know, that's the last thing we want, without ever, without ever having a discussion. I mean, um, Stephen frequently writes to powerful politicians and never gets a reply. That, that, so to go back to Frank's point about Jacinda Ardern, I mean, the, the business of treating people with dignity, with courtesy. I made a rule when I ran, was you know, part of the, the, the um, Center for Peace and Conflict Studies that every matter had to be dealt with within 48 hours. No, none of this business of waiting for three years, whether you, by the cops, in the case of Dan Oaks, what a, what a public disgrace. Um, you know, it makes me want to buy a piece of land uh, near Badgeries Creek. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's totally irrelevant, that last point. But, but please, the, I've tried to say in the book, like, here's the language. I mean, to lighten the load, I've used a lot of poetry. I haven't used as many illustrations from from um, um, sides, oh, yes. um, from uh, musicians as I should have done. But um, you, if we speak that language, we cease to stop treating students as commodities. Stop treating patients as commodities. Use a different language, um, and it's amazing what you can what you can do if you, in conversations if you try. But I mean, where was the lady or somebody said they didn't, the public didn't know who Julian Assange was. I agree with you. And in America, they don't, they barely, they don't know where, where Austria is. They think it's Australia or the other way around. If they don't, they don't actually, when I lived in Colorado, they didn't know where New Mexico was. It's just down the road. So, so the education is, is crucial. But, but um, some of us aren't there, but the education can go on in forms like this. Sorry, I'm talking too much. I'd like to propose that the language of cruelty is the language of objectification, sure. and, and that is the language we have to come to terms with. So when Jefferson's talking about visual arts, visual arts uses uh, pain, but sometimes it's to investigate by objectifying your own experience. Sometimes it's about not being the object, being the subject of an experience, right? And so what we're doing is when, when we're inflicting pain, we cease to relate to that subject and empathise with them. So um, when we see deaths in custody, um, you know, what we see is people thinking that they're doing procedures that are not inflicting pain and suffering and, uh, and death and, and ignoring the signals the red flags and or ignoring um, compliance with issues because they think they'll get away with it. So that it's the subjectification that we're really struggling with here. Uh, and we need to call that out um, by, by embracing the subject, realising that uh, the, the personal experience and unnecessary nature of... Yeah. Um, well, in your, I mean, uh, that's what, that's very valuable what you just said. In this notion of objectification, would you include 10,000 sheep on a, on a vessel going to... to right. like a, yeah, yeah, livestock. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, it's interesting, when, 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 the, when the television news is reporting on what happened in a Vietnamese or a Indonesian abattoir to Australian cattle, they, they give you a 10 second, some viewers might find this disturbing. Or eat animals, farm animals. Yeah. And then, and then, we then once not supposed to know they eat meat. sure once that caveat is given, it mean it means that we've done enough to protest. People might find this disturbing. But I think for me, the, 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 if there's going to be values, um, different values, different visions, it's got to be. We have to have another language, and and it could be, it, it, it could be, it could be expressed in all sorts of ways. As every contributor this evening has done that. 
Stuart, we all need to be deeply disturbed. Yeah. We all need to be disturbed. Yeah. Yeah. We're coming to the end, guys. Oh, yeah, we're going to make the announcement. That's okay. And is it okay if we just please let you talk for a minute? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me do it. Okay. So I think we should uh, give a really warm round of thanks to Stuart for being here tonight. And thank you very much to Linda and all of the people who have contributed with their ideas. It's been a really good discussion. This is. Um